If you are a behavior analyst, and I really believe this, you have like a superpower, man. You guys possess the friggin' greatest science in the world, and there's no doubt about that. The greatest science in the world, because what science can improve other sciences by improving the performance of the scientists? Can you argue with that? You're friggin' badasses. Every one of you guys, man, you have something that can help everybody, whether it's an individual, a group, an organization, a country, the world. This science can do it, and you possess that, man. And it makes me so, I'm so, so thankful to have kind of stumbled across it. I want you to imagine me, uh, let's blur, we're going back in time, and I'm in like these purple capris, kind of sexy, right? And I'm wearing a half shirt. Well, it's, it's Halloween. It's green makeup, and I was dressed up as the Incredible Hulk. And I'd gone out and I got my full candy, big old brown bag of candy. I was coming back and I got mugged. Man, they took my candy, man. It's sad, right? You ever seen the Incredible Hulk cry? <laughs> it's not pretty, man. It's not pretty. But fast forward like many years and having knives held in my throat, getting beat up and bullied, and all this stuff happening. And it, probably not surprised that I found my way into a boxing gym. You know, I just felt so bad about myself. And the first day I walked in the boxing gym, I was climbing through the ropes, man, like what the hell am I doing here, you know? And next thing I know, I take a beating from the professional fighter in there. He broke my nose. You know, back then the fighters didn't really have, you know, the time or the money or, you know, they didn't want to really work with somebody they didn't feel like was hungry or gritty. And so what was happening is this, this Darwinism, right? This natural selection process, except for what was being selected. Right? People that was dif disenfranchised, you know, people like me that were just sad about themselves. Not like, you know, I always wondered how many potential world champions walked through the door the same way I did to take a similar beating, never to come back because people didn't believe they had what it takes. And I've seen this happen time and time and time again in education organizations where people are dropped into the proverbial ringer of the cage only to take a beating and feel like they don't have what it takes. And then if you try to coach somebody, we talk about feeling safe. If I have my, one of my fighters and I just drop them in there and they're taking a beating, I can't coach them. They're not going to respond to my prompts then, right? They're not going to listen to my feedback because they're going to do what helps them to feel safe. Does that make sense, everybody? This is why when you help people feel safe, they can innovate. They can perform better. So by telling somebody to feel safe is not the way it works. You have to equip them with the tools that they need to be safe. And you have to support them, not just say you're fine. We have to give them what it takes to get in touch with some sort of positive reinforcement. Do you guys agree with that? And we're friggin' badass behavior analysts. We can do this. There's no doubt about it. People come out and they make these great superhero speeches, right? It's gonna be great. People get all excited. Aubrey watched about this in his book, you know, and they go to some trainings and they, you know, new processes and all this kind of stuff. They're getting all sorts of new equipment, right? And then what happens? What happens when they're not doing it? People come tell them again. And then they're not doing it and they tell them again. And then they say to them, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> they're crazy. I mean, like, you think about like, how many times you're going to tell them how many times do I have to tell you before you change it? And then the thing is, when they're still not doing it, they come back, and Aubrey says this very well, they come back and they say the same thing a little bit louder, a little bit longer, and a little bit meaner. Isn't that crazy? Why are we doing this? Aren't we behavior analysts? Why do we keep telling people and expecting things are going to change in an organization? We have to think about the consequences, right? Yeah, I don't like to be yelled at or told that stuff, man. I'm telling you. I don't want to, like, this is how I feel inside if somebody's, like, forcing me. You need to do this. You need to do that. That does not bring out the best in people. People are trying to win the battle at the expense of the war. And you have to think long term when you're trying to shape performance, when you're trying to change behavior, okay? You can't just force somebody to do something and you think it's going to be okay. It's not. It's making things worse. It's hurting the bottom line and eventually they're going to leave, okay? It's bad behavioral karma. It's going to come back to you bad. I call this behavioral myopia, all right? We seem to forget if our learner wasn't or if our client wasn't performing well, do we say, well, they're just not doing the shit they need to do? Do you say that ever? What do we do? A lot of stuff, right? Don't we try to change the environment to get the best behavior out of that client? But we don't do it when it comes to adults. I don't understand it. You know, like we shut it off. The thing is, you guys possess the toolbox right now to help people around you perform. You can help your boss perform better. You can hurt sideways, laterally, every way. You have the tools right now. 
Leading, managing, training, and coaching. And notice I didn't say leaders, managers, trainers, or coaches, because those are nouns. And your job title does not mean you're a leader, right? And you don't have to be, have a leadership position to lead. You can lead from with anywhere within an organization. Leading is about inspiring people, right? It's all about linking behaviors to results. Uh, Nick talked about that. But leaders inspire people. They bring out the best in people. They make engaging in the task reinforcement, reinforcing because people know that that task is going to bring or produce something that's better in the future, okay? Managers hold people accountable. Training involves skill acquisition, right? We have to give people the skills first before we can expect them to perform well. Wouldn't you guys agree with that? And don't think just because somebody came out of university or has a certification that they have the skills to perform, it's different. I teach my fighters all the time. I've engaged in thousands and thousands of hours of behavior skills training. Just because somebody has the skills does not mean they can perform in the natural environment. They've got to get in touch with some of those naturally occurring consequences, good and bad. What's going to happen there? Because you've got to shape your performance there. That's where coaching comes in. Coaching is about transferring those skills into the natural environment. And deliberate coaching is about using precise, purposeful, and systematic approaches to doing it, right? Before we intervene with anything, we need to know is it a can't do or it's a won't do. If it's a can't do, the intervention isn't coaching, it's training. We have to de develop the skills first. If it's a won't do, we have to do something different. Sometimes if we're a leader or a manager or a coach, we've got to reflect on our behavior to make sure that we're monitoring, we're giving feedback, we're getting in touch with reinforcement. We're helping them to see the outcomes of their own behavior. So they want to do it even when we're not there. Does that make sense everybody?